So guys, listen to those words, and after which I will comment on the meaning. And just as I did before, we will keep radical Islamic terrorists the hell out of our country. We're going to keep them out of our country. We were keeping them out. We were keeping them out. I'll also be implementing strong ideological screenings for all immigrants coming in. If you hate America, if you want to abolish Israel, if you sympathize with jihadists, then we don't want you in our country and you're not going to be getting into our country. Guys, we are entering a cultural and religious war. Those that don't see it are only fooling themselves. Look at this map. This shows you the countries where the majority of population is Muslim. Here is another map showing you the different religions around the world. And here's another map showing you the percentage of a particular religion around the world. And as you can see in the left bottom corner, the shape of the globe shows you the percentages of each religion. Currently, it is Christianity that is number one religion in the world and Islam is number two. And just to mention, look at Judaism, how small it is. And when I say Christian, I know that I am generalizing a lot because I understand that there are Christians who are Protestants, who are Catholics, who are Eastern Orthodox, who are Bible-believing Christians. So there are different types of Christians, uh, this is understood. But also there are different types of people who call themselves Muslims. You know, we have the Shia, Sunni, Wahhabi, Salafi, Sufi. So there are different types of Islam also. Now, if you want to be really specific, there are even different types of Judaism. So you have the Orthodox Judaism, you have the Progressive Judaism, you have the Conservative, you have the Chabad, Hasid, you know, there are different, different types of Judaism, of the small religion, small if we compare it to the rest of the world. So Christians can feel good when they look at this map, you know, they're the biggest group in the world. But the picture is different if you look at the growth of each religion. Here on this graph, you can see the projected growth of Christianity and Islam. And what you can clearly see is that Islam is growing much faster than Christianity. And in the year 2050, there will be as many, almost as many Muslims as there are Christians in the world. And if this trend keeps up, and there is no indication it will not, then Christianity will be surpassed by Islam, and Islam will be the number one religion in the world. And you may think to yourself, well, 2050, that's still a long time and many things can change. But actually, today, we can already see the consequences of this event that Islam is growing and getting bigger and bigger and closing the gap on Christianity. And the change is very easy to see if we look at the continent of Africa. You see, Africa used to be a continent which is very Christian. But now, if you look at Africa, it's becoming more and more Muslim. And why is this important? It's important because Africa as a continent has the highest rate of growing population. So population in Africa is growing the fastest out of all the continents in the world. And as Islam will grow, it will not only challenge the religion, uh, the Christian religion, but it will also challenge a way of thinking, a way to which the majority of the world is used to. You see, the civilization that we know, I'm talking about the Western world, so United States, the uh, North America, even the South America, Europe, uh, Australia, you know, all those countries, even Japan and uh, South Korea, they are to an extent built on a Judeo-Christian foundations. And those are the foundations that the Western world 
understands and got used to. And even though many of the countries in Europe, such as Germany, uh, Holland, France, you know, Czech Republic, they wouldn't call themselves Christians and the population of this uh, countries are not very Christian, they still function on a civilization built on those values that are Christian. But as Europe and the world will get more and more infiltrated by Islam and the population of people who are of Islamic faith will grow, the system that we know will change. Because if you will travel to an Islamic country, you will immediately see that this country is functioning differently than what are you used to. Guess why democracy never worked in countries that became Muslim? It does not work because if you implement this religion, the religion of Islam, there are certain intrinsic characteristics of this religion that prevent the society to become democratic. It's a very different structure that is built on hierarchy that goes from top to bottom. And the people at the bottom have limited rights and they need to be subordinate to the leaders. This is why when you look at the structure of many of the Islamic countries, Muslim countries, uh, let's say Middle East, uh, there is a very strong hierarchy of the society. And really a lot of those countries are in chaos. And the only way to function in those countries is if you have a strong leader that will decide everything. And you could say a dictator. Well, look at the country of Egypt. Look at the country of even Saudi Arabia. This is ruled by a ruling fam family, princes uh, that decide everything. And the normal people don't have real power in those countries. And when I say real power, I mean things like deciding the direction of the country by, for example, voting. Uh, if a prince, a king, decides something and he wants it to happen, the people don't have a say in that. Of course, they have some freedoms. They can go to a shop, they can uh, get money, they can do something, but it must be under the supervision of the leader. And really, the real problem is that those two civilizations do not work with each other. The Western world, which is, again, built on this Judeo-Christian foundation, does not work well with the other type of civilization built on the religion of Islam. And this too, when the two civilizations meet, they crash with each other and there is a lot of conflict, a lot of tension. That's why we see a lot of cities in Europe, in France, that have those, you could say, ghettos where the Muslims are concentrated and they do not integrate well with the rest of the society. And as the Muslim religion will grow, the civilizations that the Western world knows will be challenged. The way you know, the way you think, the way you lived your life will be challenged. And for some of you, it will be a dramatic experience. Let's, for example, take the countries of Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, there was an attempt to bring a democratic government in those countries. Uh, and I'm not going into, you know, why the war was happening. Was it good or not? Was it a good move or not a good move? Anyways, there was an attempt to change the country that was built on Sharia law and turn it into a more democratic civilization. 
and it didn't work. As soon as the Americans left, the country went back to Sharia law. Women cannot study, cannot have a career. Everybody needs to be Muslim, or they are in a big threat, and their life is in danger. So when Trump says those words, it's actually an attempt to fight this reality that is coming. And you can say this is the last moment where the Western civilization can still make a choice and decide what direction they will go. Because if nothing will be done, then your children will live in a totally different civilization. A civilization ruled by Islam. So it's really a wake-up call. And Trump's words are not just some words that are, you know, anti-Islamic just because he doesn't like Islamists, but it actually is an opposition to certain mechanisms that are already happening. And if you don't do anything, they will overcome you. Now, if you look at this map again, you see the blue dot, that's Israel. And Israel is surrounded by the civilization that is not compatible with the civilization that Israel has. That's why so many Muslim countries hate Israel. Because even though you may have some objections to the Israeli government, it's still a democratic functioning country. And it's in a conflict with the Islamic world. And you can look at Israel as some kind of an anchor that is put there uh, by the Western world. It's fighting for the name of the Western world. So I hope uh, this gives you an understanding why Israel is so important to the Western civilization. I was actually going to talk about something different, but it took so long that I'm going to finish with this. You know, the, the, the thing that I want you to take from this episode is that we should not give up. We should be proud about our roots. And when black is black, say it is black. When it is white, say it is white. Don't compromise for your values, for your beliefs. They are as important as the values and beliefs of people in the other camp. And when people tell you it's racist, it's not. You can have strong convictions. Thank you so much for your attention, for watching this episode. Please like the video subscribe to the channel, hit that bell button and um, be informed, be up to date when I release new episodes. I'm working hard on this second part of Israel's history using maps. So I'm working on this, but it's taking longer than usual because there is a lot of material to cover. But I hope I will be releasing it in next week. So if you're waiting for that, make sure to um, be tuned to the channel to see it when it will premiere. If you would like to uh, support this work, this channel, the best way to do it is through Patreon and PayPal. I will leave a link to those options in the description of this video. So I'm wishing you all the best. Have a great weekend. Shalom.